one of the most exciting men in history was a man in name Elijah. In various parts of the world, they still name their children <laughs> Elijah. We, do, we know nothing about his parents. We know, th know nothing about his childhood. The, uh, the only thing we know that he stepped upon the platform of human history, full grown and as rugged as an Alaskan bear. He refused to dress as other people. He did not conform. And soon he was addressing the king and the queen and the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove with such stern rebukings until they were frightened of him. They were uh, scared of this preacher man, Elijah. Now, in the book of James, in chapter 5, it says this man, Elijah, that, that he was a man subject to like passions as we are. I, I, I like that because, you know, so many times we feel that only history records the great ones of God, <clears throat> that it's all over now, and that nobody has a big and good relationship with God. But it says Elijah was a man subject to like passions. I think if you read his story, you can see it. Uh, it's amazing to me how you ask a little widow for food. It's, ama it's amazing to me how he had the audacity to pour water on wood and command fire from heaven to burn up the water and the wood. Nobody's ever done that before in history, of course. Elijah was a man just like you, two eyes, one nose. But there was something inside of him that was so dramatic. On Mount Carmel, where we're standing right now, there are literally hundreds of caves. Our guide could possibly tell you about how many caves there are. In one of those caves, this very dramatic person came to seek God. It had not rained in this land for three and one half years. Cattle were dying, streams were drying up, the land was languishing. Jezebel was the most powerful person in the whole realm. She was from Tyre, north of here from a pagan family full of the devil, and she was spreading the devil's business all through this land, causing them to work, worship Baal, an imaginary god that had ears and couldn't hear, hear and nose and couldn't smell, and a mouth that couldn't talk. Stupid as some people today, you know. And he had to come against a whole nation by himself. You know, that's greatness too. A man that's willing to do the battle alone if he has to. A man who's willing to fight with only adversaries. He did have a servant. He wasn't much good either. He had to get rid of him. He left him in Beersheba and never went back and got him. But the land needed rain, and he knew that that was an answer to making Jehovah God supreme and big and good. So in one of these caves, I've been in and out of a, num a number of them. One cave the Roman Catholics have, and they said it was this cave, and another cave that J the Jewish rabbis have, and they're sure that it was that cave. But in one of these caves that overlooks this vast, beautiful Mediterranean Sea, the Bible says he put his head between his knees he humbled himself, and he began to talk to the God that made Genesis in the beginning. 
the mighty God created the heavens and the earth, the living God. And then he created man in his own image and his own likeness. What a story. Here was a man who believed in that God, a living God. We are surrounded with beautiful clouds today, lovely birds flying over us, and the vast complex of Israel's large, a third largest city below us. No, those things were not here at that time, but the same God is here that was here at that time. He bowed himself and he began to pray. I can hear him praying right now. A good man, when he prays, is not proud. I can hear him say, God, forgive me of my sins. <laughs> I don't know that he, he even had any, but that's the way Daniel prayed. He said, I would like to pray for the nation. Forgive me of my sins. It takes greatness to do that. It takes humbleness to do that. And I can hear him say, forgive me for my sins, O oh God. Forgive my nation of their sins, O oh God. Forgive us of our, our idolatry of worshiping such a thing as Baal. Forgive our king for marrying up with a, a whore like that Jezebel that he, that he married, full of iniquity and unrighteousness and unholiness and impurity. You name it, she had it. She would kill an innocent man, call in lying witnesses that he had said something he had not said, and kill him at that same hour. An innocent man. She would forge the name of the king steal the seal of the king and put it on a letter that he sent it. He had nothing to do with it at all. She was a bad woman. He wasn't afraid of her at all. He moved out of her way one time to get himself regenerated as to what God would have to do, which was to choose his successor, Elisha, and to bring about a great miracle with the widow to show that God was able to do great things. Then he sat down right close by me here, put his head between his knees and began to talk <laughs> to the God of the universe. What a man. What a man. And he said, God, this land is famishing now. It seems to me they've been persecuted long enough and the land has been hurt long enough. And the people have seen that Jehovah's God now says, uh, please, God, uh, do something. He got to feeling good about his prayer. <laughs> you know, sometimes you feel better about it than anybody else. And he told his servant, say, hey, hey, run, run to the front of the cave and look and see if you see a cloud coming. I am not sure that he was functioning in faith at that moment. He didn't need that servant anyway. And, uh, he sure didn't need his unbelief. So the servant came and he looked out over those beautiful tempestuous waves of the Mediterranean out there and said, hey, I don't see anything out there. I've scanned the skies and I don't even see anything. So Elijah went back, put his head between his knees and said, Jehovah, let me ask again that you forgive me personally. That's, that's where good things begin, getting yourself straight. And also forgive my nation, please, for drifting away from the one that brought us through the Red Sea, brought us across the torrid sands of Sinai Desert, brought us into a land of hills and valleys, and a land that overproduces any time anybody loves the land. And we have sinned against you. Forgive us, we pray. So he prayed, and like you and me, he got to feeling good about his prayer. He said, hey, I... I feel as if something's going to happen. So he yells at his assistant, who had no faith at all, run, run. Look out the front of the cave. Look out over the Mediterranean. See if you can see a storm cloud coming. I really don't think he should have done that. 
I think he should have waited until there was real evidence that he didn't have to ask anybody's opinion about. I've discovered when you ask people's opinion, there's a lot of different opinions. And most of them are in unbelief. But he did it anyway. And that unfaithful servant yelled, nope, nope, no rain, nothing. I don't believe it'll ever rain. I think we're all going to die. And you caused it. I don't think he loved Elijah, his master, at all. He was a negative assistant. God save us all from negative assistants. So he went back, sat down, humbly put his head between his knees and began to sweat and, and, and began to weep and said, God, maybe I'm not sincere enough about this thing. Maybe I'm not doing this thing just right. You're going to have to teach me how to pray correctly. Now listen, God, I spoke. And these heavens were closed. And there hasn't been any rain for three and a half years. Seems to me that it's harder to get it started than it was to stop it. It always is. It always is. And so he prayed, and then I think he began to th thank God a little. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer. Thank you, God, for saving Israel. Thank you, God, for bringing a revival to this country. Thank you, God, that you're going to turn these people's hearts toward God. Thank you that the prophets of Baal are dead, and the prophets of the grove are dead, 750 of them, and they're dead. Thank you for it, Lord. <laughs> servant, servant, I feel good. Run, have a look. And so he went, dashing out. Scan the heavens and scan the Mediterranean. Yell back, no. No cloud. No rain. That's where you would have quit, wouldn't you? You have problems and you have sorrows and you've been praying for your husband to get saved and you decide it was easier to divorce him. You prayed for your business that God would bless it, and rather than waiting for an answer, you just sold the business, you see. You better do some thinking. Oh, we got some people that says, never pray but one time over one thing. You better tell that to Elijah. And remember, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses. He represented the prophets. Moses represented the law. And Jesus was there, and he was transfigured before them. And all they discussed was his bringing salvation to the world in Jerusalem. So even after he left this planet Earth, he didn't stop his work and his ministry. He just kept on. Blessing, 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 you see. Well, for six times he did that. Every time it was a negative answer, no, I don't see anything. You see how many times would Elijah have prayed? Well, knowing Elijah, he'd have prayed till he saw the cloud. He, 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 did, not, he did not pray seven times. He prayed till the cloud got visible. If he'd have had to pray 20 times, he'd have done that too. Not you, of course, but he would. Of course, he's the one that got the results too. So you're going to have to do some thinking. What does God expect of you to have miracles? What can God do for you to cause you to be a person unusual from the times in which you live and for the, com for the, for the problems that are around about us? Here's a man. The Bible says in the book of James that he was a man with like passions as you are. Yeah, he had his troubles, his sorrows, his ups and his downs. He was a regular human, but he prayed. <laughs> what do we need in this country of ours today is prayer. Oh, we don't have a lot of it. We have people reading prayers out of books that are hundreds of years old. They don't get as high as the ceiling, of course. We have men who think they're praying and all they're doing is apologizing to God for being alive. 
that don't do you much good either. We need prayer for our homes. Every major evil in this country right now is to destroy the homes of this country. Every major evil seeks to destroy our, our home system. It's the home that's under attack more than the government. Homosexualism is the destroyer of the home. Lesbianism is the destroyer of the home. It don't matter what you grapple with. You can't find one evil in our land that supports and strengthens the home. That just is not possible. May I urge you at this time to be an Elijah, a man of like passions as most humans, a man who is not perfect in his own ways. If there's any perfection, it's in God. A man who is so willing to reach out to God and to see mighty miracles take place. Finally, <laughs> he prayed the seventh time. The seventh time. He told his servants, said, you go to the front of that cave, and I don't mean maybe. Put your hand up above your eyes and have a look. Now, this cloud could have been there all the time. This guy didn't have his didn't, didn't have his, uh, uh, his eyes focused right. But on the seventh time, he, on this vast Mediterranean, I don't see how you could see a cloud the size of a man's hand anyway. Most clouds that I see around here, they're as big as towns, not, not a hand. He says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. I don't know where he's joking, mocking, or what he was doing, but he sure wasn't doing much. But here the man of faith says, that's enough for me. That is enough for me. I'm ready. He began to shout. He said, run, tell King Ahab that he better go in a hurry because his chair is going to get full of mud. There's mighty rains coming. Oh, you say, that's an exaggeration. No, that's a function of faith. A man of like passions as you are that believed God. Then only if God came upon this man, whew, he outran the king's horses and the king's chariot. He was out in front. He said, come on, come on. Come on, you're going to get washed away with a flood. He ran all the way to Jezreel, at least 20 miles through that valley of Megiddo to Jezreel, from up around Carmel where we're standing right now. I tell you, he could have won a prize for that run and for that race. And that's the story of Haifa. <laughs> and that's the story of Elijah. And that's the story of Mount Carmel with its great rock, bedrock, standing here for centuries and millennia. And one man of God passed by. His name was Elijah. Maybe it's time for you to pray to the God of Elijah. And remember that these words are spoken where he prayed on Mount Carmel. And they're behind me are the waters of that great sea that he looked at called the Mediterranean. And the same God of Elijah lives now. He lives now. I challenge you to believe in God, to put your faith in God, to put your faith to work. Stop playing games. God is now ready to do that which has never been done before. Let's reach up to God and receive the power of God. I love you. God loves you. And that God is the God of Elijah. Receive him now in Jesus' name. Thank you.